Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing the kind of God you are through Jesus Christ. Amen. As we see people rising up in the Arab countries against dictatorship and seeking for the freedom which you have given to every one of your intelligent creatures, we thank you for the good news that you are not a dictator, you are not a tyrant. You do not kill those who oppose your government. As we look at this good news, teach us and set us free in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 As I said last night, when people look around the world, 
and see calamities, destruction, and disaster, they are quick to say either that there is no God, there can't be a God, or that if there is a God, he is either careless, that is, don't care, or he is a tyrant who is crushing and killing the opponents of his government. As I said last night, many people have no higher opinion of God than they do of Gaddafi. And they feel that they must serve God, otherwise one day God is going to burn them for opposing his government. So what picture do you have of God? What do you think of God's government? What kind of person do you think God is? And if you are serving God out of fear, I'm afraid you're in trouble. Open your Bible with me to 1 John chapter 4 a minute and see something there before we get cracking. When I was a little boy in Barbados in the Caribbean, I don't know if it happens in America, but in the Caribbean in the old time days, preachers would come around early in the morning. And one morning, a preacher came around, it was 4 o'clock in the morning early. And he said that God is going to strike down somebody in this village because this village is a sinful village. And I woke up terrified and ran to my mother and asked her, does God kill people if they're disobedient? I was terrified. My mother had told me the day before that it was hard ears. You know that? West Indian dinner. Here is her. So I thought the preacher could have met me. I was terrified. So even religionists and Christians have contributed to the picture people have had of God as one who puts down opposition by force and who is intolerant. But we have a text here before we get started, uh, a text that needs pondering. First John, chapter four. Listen to what it says. First John, chapter four, verse 18. First John, chapter four, verse 18. You have it? First John four, 18. There is no fear in love. You heard that? There is no fear in love. So if you are serving God because you are afraid of hell fire, listen to me carefully, you don't love him. Because there's no fear in agape love. You may say, Brother Daniel, I don't agree with you. I love God, but I'm afraid of hell. But I said, notice what I said, if you are serving God out of fear, then the Bible says there is no fear in love, and your love needs to be perfected. Is that what that says? Look on. Look at what it says. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. The Greek translation says, fear has to do with thinking about punishment. He that is afraid is not made perfect in love. God meets us where we are. You might have come to God because you were afraid of something. But God meets you where you are, accepts you in his son, and then God wants to perfect love in you so that all fear will be cast out. Now by nature we are afraid of death ever since Adam fell. And for those of us who are planning to be in that illustrious group, 
which will be translated at the second coming of Christ, which will go through the time of trouble such as never was. For those of us, for those of you who are visiting with us, Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says that there's going to be a time of trouble. So the tsunami in Japan and the earthquake in Japan and the terrible twisters or tornadoes that obstruct certain parts of the USA, that is nothing yet to compare with what is going to happen in this world. There's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. And the question is, who will cause that time of trouble? Will it be God? That's the question. Okay, so let us go back to the beginning. And an important question we have to settle in our minds is this. Do we as human beings, do all of God's creatures, as creatures, have genuine choice? And I'm going to ask this question in another way before we go to the text. If I come into your house and ask you for five dollars to catch a bus to go somewhere, and I said, please give me the five dollars, and you have the choice, you don't have to give me, but I'm begging you. You said no, and I leave. I said thank you, and I leave. I'll give you a free choice, okay? But if I come into your house with a gun, I say, if you don't give me five dollars to catch the bus, I'm going to shoot you. You still have a choice, but have I given you free choice? No. I'm not applying coercion or force. So has God given to us genuine choice? Yes. You say yes. yes. And people are quick to say yes. The answer is yes. But people are quick to say yes, and then when you carry on the point, yes. you find out that, that, that yes is a joke. Because they end up saying that if you do not serve God, ultimately, he's going to kill you. So that yes was only religious talk. You know, people can give religious talk that they know is acceptable, but don't really mean it. What Jesus calls that? Phariseeism. The Pharisees were experts at talking what they did not believe in their hearts. So the question is again, I don't shout out the yes too soon, do you really believe that God has given us genuine, real, free choice? Okay. Genesis, the first book in the Bible. Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis 2 and verse 7. And then we're going, to, we're going to go from verse 7 to verse 17. So in Genesis chapter 2, <coughs> verse 7 and verse 17. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. You got that? Yes. Verse 17 now. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. These two texts put together, as I said last night, teach us a lot. First of all, these two texts put together destroy the popular religious doctrine that man has an immortal soul. Some of our visitors might have come from a background or religion where people teach that man has an immortal soul. I'm afraid to tell you 
I'm sorry that I have to tell you that that doctrine is not correct. And it is easy to prove that it is not correct in the Bible because the Bible says, the soul that sinner, it shall die. Yes. Ezekiel 18.4. Now, when God formed the man of the dust of the ground and said he was a living soul, if man could not die because he was immortal, it would be absurd for God in verse 17 to say, in the day you depart from my government, in the day you disobey me, you will surely die. Because an immortal soul cannot surely die. So right away, right away, you see Satan, when he came and told Eve, if you disobey God, you will not surely die. Satan was saying God is a liar. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You will not die if you depart from God's government. And listen carefully now, he was also implying that if she did die, it would have to be that God would have to kill her. You with me? Yes. Let me explain it again. If I present to you a glass of apple juice and a glass of potassium cyanide, and I tell you that drinking the apple juice is health given, and drinking the potassium cyanide will kill you, and someone comes after me and says, don't mind Dr. Douglas, he's an idiot. You can drink potassium cyanide and you will not die. And if I, to prove my point, listen carefully, if to prove my point, when you drink the potassium cyanide, I kill you, you see the confusion that, that, that you're in? Because if potassium cyanide kills you, I don't need to kill you if you drink it. I need to try and save you from death if you drink it. You follow me? So right there at the beginning, Satan planted a lie and a deception in human beings. One, that sin doesn't really hurt or kill anybody. It is God who is intolerant and who will kill you because you have a different opinion to him. See that lie? That is why in Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 we are told that Satan is the deceiver of the whole world. Welcome to our guests. Feel comfortable. Have a seat. Relax. So we're at Genesis 2.7, and Genesis 2.17, right at the beginning, we see God saying to Adam and Eve, if you disobey me, if you move away from my government, you're going to surely die. And look at uh, Genesis 3 and verse 4. Genesis 3.4, Satan said unto the woman, ye shall not surely death. So we have the word of God and the word of Satan right at the beginning of human history. God is saying, if you depart from my way, you will surely die. Genesis 2 17. And Satan is saying to Adam and Eve, if you depart from God's way, you won't surely die. Right at the outset of human history. Who? was telling the truth, who was telling lies. Let me tell you something. You meet most people in the world and ask them that question, they will say, oh, God can't lie. When you go further, you see that the majority of human beings, the Bible says it, and we know it, the majority of human beings believe Satan's lie. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 9, that Satan has deceived the whole world. So it means the whole world believes Satan's lie, although if you ask them, they will say, God doesn't lie. See that double trick? Ask human beings around the world, religious human beings, oh, God doesn't lie. But when you check them out, who doesn't believe in an immortal soul believes that God is a killer. 
So they still believe Satan. Well, saying, so Satan is the master contributor, you know. <coughs> Satan is a master contributor. And Satan's counterfeits are not clumsy. I often tell a story of, when, of a chap back home. When we are leaving the Caribbean to come to America, we, well, you know, the American dollar bill is the gold standard. And we try to get U.S. dollars to come to America with. And we don't want counterfeit dollars, so we go to authentic sources. A friend of mine went to a bank to get U.S. money so as not to be counterfeited because he could have gone to a taxi driver or he could have gone to, I have a brother at home who operates a tourist jet ski business, so he gets U.S. dollars from the tourist and he could have gone to him, but he felt that going to somebody other than a bank, he could have been contributed. So he went to the bank and got his U.S. dollars from an authentic source. You following me? And the other friends went to their other friends and got U.S. dollars ordinarily. And they all came to America. And they landed, and they started to do their business. Lo and behold, the chap who went to the authentic source back home to get his U.S. dollars, when he went to do business, he saw the person transacting the business looking very carefully at the U.S. dollars he was giving them and then sent a message to the back. And soon he realized that he was in trouble. Police were coming for him. And he said, but I went to a bank and got this U.S. money so as not to be caught up in contributing. My friends went to anybody else. <coughs> Satan can counterfeit you even from what you think is an authentic source. So you have to make sure that you don't think the source is authentic, that the source is authentic, and the only authentic source is God. So Satan's counterfeits can come very close. So you ask the majority of people, is God a liar? No. Who's telling the truth? God. They say, okay, let's talk. Let's talk. Next question. Do human beings really die when they die? Oh, no, 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 no. They don't die when they die. And does God kill sinners? Of course he will kill them or burn them up. So after the initial talk, you see that they really believe Satan's lie. No wonder Jesus says that the devil was a murderer and a liar, John 8, 44, from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his native accent. You have different accents in America? Yes. You have different accents in uh, the Caribbean. Do you understand my friend every time he speaks to you, uh, Pablo? <laughs> he has what is called a white Bajan, Barbadian accent. If he talks too fast, I have to get translated to you're Spanish. Different accent. Well, Jesus says that when Satan tells a lie, that is his native accent. Okay. So we started at the beginning. Genesis 2 7. Genesis 2 17. Let's go now to Isaiah 1 18. See what kind of God. Now, uh, is Gaddafi telling Libyans, come and let us reason together? You got to be saying, if you don't submit to my government, it's in a video. <laughs> Listen to God now. Isaiah 1 18. Moving step by step. Isaiah 1 18. Now, right now, in the Arab world, people are rising up for freedom and human rights. Do you hear any of those dictators saying to the people, <coughs> come and let us reason together? So the dictators are sending tanks and guns on the street to shoot those who oppose their regime. And many people have a picture of God like that. Is our God Gaddafi? No. Or Hitler? No. Okay. Now, America... United States of America sets the ideal government. Most of you here are American. Well, you're, you're not aliens like I am, you're American. <laughs> well, the best form of government in a sinful form.
control of world is the American democratic system. Republicanism and Protestantism. That's the best form of government in the central fallen world. Okay? That is why the only country pictured as a lamb in Bible prophecy is the United States of America before it turns dragon-like. Revelation 13, 11 is America in prophecy. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth with two horns like a lamb, but it will speak as a dragon. Right now, America is still in the lamb-like phase, defending liberty and standing for liberty. And however bad things are in America, America is still the best country in the world according to the principles of freedom. You have all the good up here, and you have all the bad, and you must make the choice. Amen. I wish I had the fruits you have up here, down in Barbados, and the vegetables, and so on. Okay? And as I said last night, here is a country with all the fruits and vegetables, all the good food. And every year in this country, the United States of America, the world's number one country, you have the best medicine and the best technology. 800,000 people die of heart attacks from eating rubbish. Freedom of choice. The great controversy worked out right here in this country. And no American can go before God and give any excuse for a heart attack because when I go into your supermarkets and your food places, I start to uh, go crazy. All these foods, I wish you could just grab them back up, all the broken and carry them back to bar, but I don't see them. And you bypass all that goodness and go to McDonald's and eat cancer and uh, grease stripped it down and so on. Don't get messed with me. I love you. Freedom of choice. Listen to God in Isaiah 1.18. Listen to God. Isaiah 1.18. Come now. Listen to God. Would, God, would Gaddafi do this? Does Satan do this? Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Okay, we're going to sing, come and let us talk. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wood. I am willing to completely forgive you of everything because of my love. I sent my son to die for you. I am willing to forgive you. Verse 19. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So God sets before us the genuine choice. Uh, if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the, mouth, with the sword. Who's the sword? Who's the sword? The word of God. Now, by now, you know you don't want religious answers. I want real answers. I, people give me religious talk. And then when I ask them the second question, they hope to see. So, the word of God is the sword. In this context, in this context, the word of God is the sword. All right, let's go a little further. Let's go, let's go a little further. <coughs> let's go a little further. Matthew 26, 51. Matthew 26, 51. Remember that story, Matthew 26, 51, that account? Jesus had just been arrested. Look at verse 50. And Jesus said unto them, Friend, therefore art thou come. Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Matthew 26, verse 50. Verse 51 now. And one, and behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. He was really aiming for his neck and missed and cut off his ear. Verse 52. Then said Jesus unto him, who is this fellow though? Peter. Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. What's the sword? Now listen carefully. Don't mix up the sword 
of the spirit with this sword we're talking about. Okay? Two different swords. This sword is a weapon. Represents destruction. Okay. And whoever lives by the sword will perish with the sword. You have Obama, uh, President Obama just uh, achieved the destruction of Osama bin Laden. Before he called him, he was Osama bin Hayden. <laughs> but Osama killed many people many with his terrorist network and felt secure in this upper class neighborhood in Pakistan. Nobody could catch him. It's a sure law of the universe. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. The papacy killed millions of people during the Dark Ages. Then in 1798, General Berthier, under Napoleon, went and captured Pope Pius VI, and he died of starvation. If you live by force, you will die by force. If you crush people's rights, your rights will eventually be crushed. That's a law of nature. Question. So, you see what Jesus is in? Think us now that I can offer to my Father and that he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Jesus didn't have to live by the sword. Look at John 16, uh, John 18, 36, before we come back here to an important point. Of course, Revelation 30, 10 tells us the same thing. But look at John uh, 18, 36. John 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. Is that that? So killing and fighting and using the sword, that is not part of God's kingdom. Not part. And God is saying, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you rebel, you will be devoured by the forces of evil. The sword. You with me? Good. I'm going to put this point to you before we go any further. To say that God has given his intelligent creatures freedom of choice, and then to say that he kills those who choose another government, is absurd. It is a contradiction. If God has given us freedom of choice, and we can either choose God's government or choose another government. The other government is the government of Satan's sin. If we end up with problems and the disasters, for example, the tsunami and the earthquakes, cancer, heart attack, motor accidents, crime, all of these things are the result of sin. And sin causes these things because sin has separated our planet from God's government. Remember, there was election day in the Garden of Eden. And God so loves freedom, and freedom is so important to God, that God gave Adam and Eve the opportunity to choose. You know, there's some governments that don't give their people the opportunity to vote. That man was in power in Egypt for how long? Mubarak. God told Adam and Eve, there are two governments in the universe now, and you will have opportunity to vote, to choose. And on election day in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve voted the government of God out and voted Satan's government in. So the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, that sin and death entered our world by the one act of Adam. You know what that text is? Sin and death entered by Adam. Where's that text? Where's that text from? Turn quickly to Romans. Romans 
chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. That's what Satan accomplished through Adam. You follow me? So Adam voted in sin and death, and voted out righteousness and life, on that election day in the Garden of Eden. And ever since then, human beings have been voting, trying to get back the right government. And we will only get the right government when at last, according to the Bible, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ at the seventh trump. That's right. When you're voting for one president next time, you're voting for next president in Barbados week, Put in the Barbados Liberal Party, then we put in the Democratic Liberal Party in Jamaica, is the GLP or the PNM, always looking for an ideal government. And the mere fact that you vote out one or vote out the next means we haven't found the ideal yet because the only ideal government is the government of God. Amen. And Adam voted out that government at the only election that really mattered in the history of mankind. If God's government had remained in control of the world, there would be no earthquakes, no tsunami, no hurricanes, no cancer, no death. It is because our world was separated from God's government by Adam's choice. And this is the thing about God. If you ask God to leave, and you mean it, and he explains things to you, and you still mean it, he leaves. He's not like a in those colors. If you ask him to go, he will go. God is not a tyrant. He's not a dictator. If you vote him out, he leaves. He respects your freedom. Don't forget, God made you free, and he will not invade your freedom even a hair's breadth. If you tell him to go, he will explain everything, and if you mean it, he will leave. But answer me. The only life giver in the universe is God. I, I said last time, I'm saying it again for those who are visiting with us because I want to make sure these issues are playing. In Isaiah, you can read Isaiah 43 and 44 and 45, those chapters. You see God giving a kind of blessing. He said, I looked all around the universe to see if there was another God. And I saw none other. I only I am Yahweh and beside me there is no God. All through Isaiah, you see that written down. Chapters 43, 44, 45, 46, reading your spirit time. Now, if God is without beginning and without end, and he is, it means that the principles which operate inside God are the only absolute principles of life in the universe. Are you with me? Now, the existence of God is a mystery, you know. But let me tell you something. If you look around, suppose you were walking through a jungle or a desert or a forest, and everything was wild and chaotic, and all of a sudden you came to all of a sudden you came to a clearing, and you saw a table with some chairs and a tablecloth. What would you conclude? That at last, in your journey through this jungle, you've come across some kind of intelligence, other people, and they were here before you, and they've set up this space. Wherever we see complexity with a design for a particular objective, you know that intelligent design was behind it. Let me repeat that again. You see a stove, you see a radio, you see a television, you see complex entities, and they are designed for a particular objective. Do you ever conclude that they happen by chance? Are you following me? I am a medical doctor. I was trained in science. I have some friends of mine who went to university with me who don't believe in God.
and they come to me with this talk. They, they're very educated. They think so. And they say, oh, Dr. Douglas, uh, you know, uh, you Christians have to exercise faith. And if you're a man of science, you shouldn't be exercising faith because science does not depend on faith. I said, I'm glad you said that. Science does not depend on faith. I say, so tell me what science depends on. Science has to observe and come to conclusions, or if it can't observe and come to conclusions, scientists experiment and see what happens when they experiment and write down their conclusions. I say, you're correct. Wonderful. I said, make your next point now. He said, my point is that there is no God. And you can't prove there is a God. I said, okay. And your third point? He said, we evolved. We came here by chance. I said, answer me now. Is evolution scientific or not? He says, it is scientific. I said, no, you just told me what scientific means. So answer me now. Has anyone ever observed evolution? He started scratching his head. He said, well, no. I said, can you do an experiment to draw conclusions about evolution? He said, no. He said, let me tell you something, that evolution is not a science. It is not scientific. It is a matter of faith. And you have to have more, I said, I'm not using, even going to use the word faith. You have to have more or reasonable belief. Because look at the human brain, look at the human heart, look at the kidney, look at the complexity with a design for a particular object. And you tell me that that happened by chance? So it reminded me of the story that I, that I heard the young people saying back home. An atheist went before judge making a fuss that the Christians have a day, they have a have uh, various, various days to celebrate, and that atheists are being afraid because they have no day. You know what the judge told him? You have a day. Every first of April is your day. <laughs> because the Bible says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Every first April is your day. Because let me tell you something. If you show a man this apparatus here, which is complex design to build your cave. And you ask the man, how do you think this came about? He said, oh, after millions of years, pieces of metal glued together. <laughs> after another million of years, piece of glass stuck in. And this came by chance. You were put him in the mental asylum. <laughs> and this is far simpler than the human brain that made it. Amen. Look at the eye and the ear, all of these complexities. So that is why scientists are now saying, that the evidence is clear that where we see complexity, there must have been intelligent design. Amen. And the evolutionists have no answer. So it is true that the fool is the one who says there is no God. Amen. Okay? The fool is not a man who never went to school, you know. I, I know a lot of fools who have four PhDs. <laughs> but they say there is no God. And I know a lot of people who never went to school who believe in God and they're blessed. Amen. Now, so God is infinite in power, in wisdom and love. And God made us free. And we have freedom of choice. And all the calamities we see in the world today are the result of separation from God's government by sin. But God is so loving, although we voted him out, he stood outside the House of Assembly, outside of Congress. In the British system, we have the House of Assembly. In your system, we have the Houses of Congress and so on. Am I, am I right? Oh, okay. God voted out of the White House, and he stands beside it, and he said, if I abandon them all together, they can't survive. So although they voted me out, I'm going to have to work behind the scenes to enable them to survive. Oh, what a God. I have a plan for more eternity. I'm going to send my son. And sin, sin separates from me. Sister Dublin, give your text and her presentation. Let's turn to it. James. James. 
Brother Rich, give me a verse at a time, please. James. Chapter 1. 13 to 17. James 1, 13 to 17. Then we're going to come to some important conclusions. Ten minutes left. James 1, 13 to 17. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust or desire and enticed. This is temptation. This is temptation. Temptation is not sin. Was Jesus really tempted? No. We want that for Sabbath school. Was Jesus really tempted? And everybody said yes. That was a religious answer. Because the next question was, was Jesus drawn away of his own lust and enticed? No! Because we all don't know what <laughs> I just asked them, was Jesus really tempted in all points like as I am? Yes! Because that was a religious answer. And when I asked, now let's turn. Let's look at the mechanism of temptation in James 1. To be tempted, you have to be drawn away by a desire and be enticed. Did that happen to Jesus? Everybody said no. You see what I mean by religious answers? So I'm going to ask a question now. Was Jesus really tempted in all points like as we are? Yes. Which means according to James, he was drawn away by desire and enticed but had to resist and conquer by the grace of God. Yeah. True or false? True. That's the very heart of the 88 message. He was really tempted. True. Now, many of our fellow Christians in the other churches don't really believe that Jesus was really tempted because they don't believe that Jesus took on our sinful fallen flesh, yeah. which is what Paul tells us in Romans 8, 1-3. He came in the sameness of fallen nature and condemned sin in the flesh. So God sent his son into the very cancer that is killing us. What a God. What a God. We were in the sea drowning. And God sent his son into the same ocean. If he Jones puts it this way. And God said to his son, I'm not going to give you any special favors. I'm going to treat you like everybody else. You have to trust me and gather them together in that wild ocean and get them back to shore. And hallelujah, Jesus gathered us in his arms and brought us to shore through the raging current by absolute trust and surrender to his Father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. So he came in our sinful flesh, was really tempted in all points as, as we are. All the temptations you suffer, all the temptations I suffer, and all the temptations the other man suffers, Jesus endured and overcame. Praise the Lord. And his victory is ours. So the father sent his son into the sin problem. This is the kind of God we serve. Into our mess. The mess that we created. As I said last night, when Jesus came to the earth, science was not even conceived, let alone born. So the things you take for granted, like cell phones, and television, and stoves, and refrigerators, I said last night that Jesus had to do his ablutions. That's a big word for what we say the West Indies, number one and number two, which may be foreign to America. It means uh, number one and number two. <laughs> and, and Jesus had to do all that by digging a hole in the earth. If you know how to go and dig a hole in the earth to do your ablutions, you will think it infra dignity. But it be? You are accustomed to water toilet that flushes. Jesus did not have that. So if President Obama visits a country, or Queen Elizabeth visits a country, or the Prime Minister of Spain visits a country, and when he gets to that country, they tell him, well, we have no modern amenities, we have no modern facilities. If you want to uh, ease your bowels, I'll show you to a piece of bush. <laughs> that President or Head of State would immediately catch the next year, then we turn. But the majesty of heaven, the one who created all things, came to our planet. First of all, he had to be born in a cow stall. And as a human being down here, he had to do his ablutions by digging a hole in the earth. And he did not go back and say, that is infrared. He endured it all to save a wretch like me. Amen. That is the character of God. That is the love of God. 
So he came into our experience. And the most amazing thing is this, as I close off with these quotations. On the cross, as he died, and don't forget, he died a first death. He died what the Bible calls a first death. And he died the real death, which is a second. On the cross, this is what he was saying. I have taken all of your sin and guilt and shame. Sin separates from my father. But my father loves you so much that he sent me, his eternal son, to take all of your sin on me. And I'm going to let that sin separate me from my father. So that I'm going to die the death that you should die for you. To set you free. So I'm not proving, Jesus on the cross is saying, I am not proving Satan a liar. He said that you would not surely die. I am surely going to die for your sins because sin kills. And my father is not the one who is killing me. All I can say is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is sin that is separating me from my father. And my father has to let me go and give me up because he's the God of freedom. I am identifying with you, Elliot Dublin. You are a wretched sinner. And I'm taking your sin upon me and dying for you in your place. And your sin will separate me from the Father so that I can save you. I'm therefore showing you that God has told the truth. It is sin that kills. And that you are not immortal. You will surely die. But I've come, Jesus says, to bring immortality and life to light through the gospel. So I'm going to close with these quotations uh, for Adventist, for Adventist friends who are here. Uh, quickly, in the last two minutes, thank God we're going to Three minutes. That's wonderful. Okay. Listen carefully. God wants us to have, to know that we have genuine choice. It is a serious thing not to give human beings or intelligent creatures choice, they will rebel. That's what's happening on the Arab world. In America, in the early days, when I was a little boy growing up, I heard in America of uh, when black people couldn't ride on the buses. And then what happened? The blacks rose up. Because anytime you interfere with freedom and rights, Sooner or later, those people will rise up. So even in America, with the ideal of democracy, freedom and rights took long. It took long for women to get the vote. It took longer for blacks to get the vote. And now behold, you have a colored president. You see how it's come? 50 years ago, you told people in America that they would have a colored president. Uh, you betrayed me, see? But this is the point. The world and all of its creatures were made free. And human beings yearn for rights and freedom. And anytime people are crushed down, they will rise up. And later on in this camp, when we get into prophecy, you will see what will happen in the future. So listen to these steps now. God has given us genuine choice. It is not God that hurts us. Read these steps quickly for me as we close. Proverbs 8, 35 and 36. When we choose God's government, we get eternal life. When we choose Satan's government, we get eternal death. The eternal life we get from God's government cannot come from Satan. And the eternal death we get from Satan's government cannot come from God. Because the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life. If you work for me, you can't go to Brother Ken for payment. If you work for Satan, you don't get paid by God. The wages of sin come from Satan's government itself, which is death. So Proverbs 8, 35 and 36. Let's read that. For who, Proverbs 8, 35 36. For whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Watch it now. He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Proverbs 8, 35, 36. God is 
not the source of death. He's not the cause of death. It is separation from him that causes death. Look at Proverbs 11, 5 and 6. Proverbs 11, 5 and 6. When I was a little boy growing up in Barbados uh, on, the, on all lovely beaches, uh, hope the Jamaicans don't get messed with me, but Barbados has the best beaches in the Caribbean. But those Americans who don't know, let, don't let Jamaicans go Barbados has the best beaches in the Caribbean, okay? Good. All right. Now, we would go on the beach. They had a fellow who would go on the beach and dig a hole and put a piece of newspaper over the hole and put sand on top of it so that when you came along walking, you would think it is all beach when there is really a hole there and you would fall in. And he would stay in the bushes and laugh. Call it childish pranks? Okay. One day he dug a hole and put the newspaper over it and sprinkled back the sand. And he was always getting lashes because he was really what we call in Caribbean terms hard ears. And his mother called him. He went home for some punishment. And he forgot where he dug the hole. <laughs> coming back down the beach, now we were in the sea swimming. And we saw him coming down the beach. And he doesn't know where he has the hole, so he's going to now to set up another hole. Where we heard, there's a nice old Barbadian term, Quirker down. <laughs> down in the hole that he had dug, he fell. And somebody shouted out from the sea, an old man, that's what the scripture says, boy. When you take a hole from somebody else, you will fall in it. This is what this text says. Listen to the text. Proverbs 11, 5 and 6. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, this is Proverbs 11, 5 and 6, but transgression, transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. See that? God is telling out that there is sin that causes destruction. God is not the killer. Look at Proverbs 12, Proverbs 12, 8. In the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. You got how much? Proverbs 12, 8. Are you still looking for it? Proverbs 12, 28. Sorry. Let me, let me find it. Proverbs 12, 28. That's right. In the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, is no death. Now is God's way the way of righteousness? Yes. yes. So in the way of righteousness, which is God's way, there is no death. So death does not come from God or God's government. You follow me? Okay. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Make a note of all these texts. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Listen now. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. From where does he reap corruption? From the flesh. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap eternal life. Look at Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. So the money, the currency that Satan pays you in, after you spend a whole life working for him, is a currency called death. But when you serve God, God gives you eternal life. Because you can't work for it, so God gives it to you. Amen. Jesus has already worked it out for you, so God gives it to you free. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Now listen to this statement from the Spirit of Prophecy as we wrap up. Listen carefully. This is Selected Messages, Book 1, page 235. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 235. Listen to this comment. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. You heard that? We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. The other day, a patient came to my office for a checkup. And he's a Christian. And I was surprised. He told me, Dr. Douglas, 
I am fed up with Christians blaming God for Satan's nasty work. So I put on my stethoscope and sat back in my chair and said, what are you talking about? Because you don't hear this talk from all fellow Christians in other denominations. So I'm pleasantly surprised. He said, I'm tired going to funerals and hearing people say, God was ready for this man and God took this man. He said, that is not so. God doesn't take anybody. I was blessed. So we finished medical talk. We had a whole theological talk. Ellen White said she attended a funeral once. And she was tempted more than once to walk out. Should you walk out of a service? Not really. So the servant the Lord was tempted to walk out. He must ask how rough it was. She said the minister was talking pure rubbish. He said, this man was taken of the Lord. The Lord laid him to rest. And Ellen White said she saw that the man was intemperate and burnt out his life, and the Lord wanted him to live. The Lord did not take him. I understood what the white man because the other day he went to a funeral in a church back home, and up to now, I cannot tell you what the minister said. I am not dead. So I listen carefully, and I don't know what the minister said, so I came and asked what some church members who belong to that church, can you tell me what the sermon was all about? He said, well, Dr. Duncan, after giving condolences to the relatives, he didn't hear anything more. You know what? If you preach and blame God for sickness, disease, and death, you are re-echoing the first life. You shall not surely die. It is God that is doing the killing. And at funeral services, when there's an opportunity to clear God's name, ministers of the gospel incriminate God in Satan's crime. And because, because God is seen leaving the scene, he's brought to court. A good man to go to court is by the help, you know, but I mean, went to court. But I told me a police caught him uh, running a red light, but he had a reason. He had to slow down because a little child was there about to cross. Otherwise, he would have been in full flow of the green light. So when he made sure the child was safe and he went on, this police who was traveling a different road, a police lady, caught him, went in the red light, so she thought, and reported it. So Abby said he, he didn't uh, worry about paying the fine because he went to court and defended himself. And he told the judge, I was on time with the green light. I'm moving swiftly when I saw in the shadow of my eye a young child who looked like she might venture into the road. So I pressed brakes to clarify that situation and proceeded. And just as I got to the other side, the light changed. The judge says, thank you, case dismissed. Okay? Because in many scenarios, God is seen leaving the scene. And why is he leaving? Because he's been voted out. He is said to be the one incriminated. In fact, he is leaving because he's voted out. And it is his departure that leaves the person defenseless, and the hurt comes, and then God gets blamed. So listen carefully as we conclude. It is not fear of punishment. Uh, sorry, this quote. We are not to regard God as ready to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, selected messages, book one, two, three, five. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. You got that? Yeah. And Christ object lessons 84, God destroys no man. Everyone who is destroyed will have destroyed himself. And just before I give the last quote and finish this lecture, and I have the next, so don't mind that. I may take a little bit of time on this. This is the point. If you are submitting this, and you know the health reform message, but all day long you are eating animal fat and foolish things, okay? But you pray to God, God, keep my coronary arteries clear. 
Another man though is an atheist. He lives in Russia, does not believe in God, but hears of health reform. And he eats a vegetarian diet. He keeps away from animal fat. He isn't praying to anybody. But listen to the strict laws of the universe. Whose coronary arteries are going to be blocked up? You that believe in God and are praying for God to clear that which he cannot clear because he's giving you freedom of choice. You with me? God is not arbitrary. A friend of mine who was a strict Adventist was once invited to a Jehovah's Witness wedding. Hey, I don't know what Adventist doing at a Jehovah's Witness wedding. But he went. He was, he was tolerant. And on the table was a big pig roasted with an apple in his mouth. <laughs> and the Jehovah's Witness deliberately asked the Adventists to pray for the blessing of the meal. <laughs> and this Adventist is an old brother Bruce who uh, spirit no quarters. This is how brother Bruce prayed. Oh Jehovah, if you can bless what you have cursed, bless this one. That's the end of the wedding. So God is not arbitrary. God is not arbitrary. Fixed principles operate. Are you with me? Okay. It is not fear of punishment or hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love <coughs> revealed throughout his life on earth from Bethlehem to Calvary's cross. And the sight of that love attracts them. And of course, we know the one that we told with last night, these are Genesis 759. God does not use compulsory force to put down rebellion. So right now in this, world, in this world, God is letting the rebellion run its course. Sin must run its course. And as sin runs its course, the unlucky universe is seeing that Satan is a liar. That sin, whenever it is finished, produces death. Earthquakes, tsunami, destruction, heart attacks, strokes, all these things result from separation from God's perfect way. God made Adam to live forever. It is sin that brought in destruction and death. And all of us now have freedom of choice. Shall we vote God's government back in? Shall we choose Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and accept the kingdom of God? Because a time of trouble such as, as never was is coming. And as we shall see as we get into the prophecies, freedom of choice and the character of God are central to the great controversy and to Bible prophecy and its correct understanding. Those who are visiting with us, I want to leave you the good news just before we pray. God is not a tiger. God is not a dictator. God is not a killer. God has given us freedom of choice. All the Bible language such as wrath, God punishing, God exercising wrath, the Bible explains what it means. Jesus himself felt the full wrath of God against sin for us. And what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The wrath of God is explained in Romans 1. When we make up our minds against God, he gives us up, leaves us alone, and withdraws. That separation, that withdrawal, is the wrath. And we're told in Psalm 90, verse 10, that all of us live our lives under the wrath. And the wrath of God simply means these powers of nature that have now been twisted. Look at that tornado. We call, you call it a twister. When God first made the world, could there be any tornadoes? When it was under his government, the atmosphere and everything was under perfect control. Because sin has separated our world from God, the atmosphere and everything have gone out of control. And you can get these twisters that can do more damage than an atomic bomb. So when a twister hits a, 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 a country, for anybody to say that God sent it would be telling lies on God. It is now the result of sin. And listen carefully. As sin increases and God has to withdraw because people do not want him, the four angels of strife are loosening because the sentiment of mankind is we don't want you. 
we have bread enough to get on without you. We don't, we don't have, we don't need you anymore. And as these angels loosen, calamities will increase. But the angels will hold the winds of strife until the people of God are sealed. That is where prophecy comes in, and we will look at that in our next session and later on tonight. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that your government is the government of life, blessing, happiness, and peace. That if Adam and Eve had never voted your government out on election day in the Garden of Eden, there would have been no sickness, death, destruction, calamity, earthquake, tidal wave, hurricane, or any of the things that people now call acts of God by the insurance companies. But we thank you that you've not abandoned us. You sent your son into this mess that we produce to obey for us, to die for us, to overcome sin for us. In our sinful fallen flesh, he was tempted in every point like as we are, overcame. And now he gives us the free gift of righteousness, forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. And the day is coming in which you will give every man the government of his choice. That is what judgment means. Those who have chosen Satan's government, you will give them up to Satan's government, which is death. And those who have chosen your government by choosing Christ, you will give them eternal life. We thank you that perfect love casts out all fear. We are not to serve you out of fear. You are seeking to heal and to save and to deliver. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You can take a two-minute break, but take a two, three-minute break for water or anything, and we come back for our last session before lunch. And may God bless you real good 